Hey, hi everyone. I'm Karen Rideout, a policy analyst at the BC Center for Disease Control and National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health, and would like to welcome everyone to today's BCCDC Environmental Health uh, Seminar Series. And I'm very pleased to introduce a group of four presenters today, Wilson Yu, Winifred Lau, Kimberly Rickson, and Kathy Wong. And uh, we first met this group in the fall of 2013 when they were environmental health students at the BC Institute of Technology and they did a course project for their health promotion course uh, with us here at BCCDC. And they did such a fantastic job that we jumped at the opportunity to have them uh, put together this webinar for you today. Um, so they're all now graduates of that program and certified public health inspectors and I'll just throw out that they are actually all on the job market and available for uh, work. So if, if anyone's got opportunities, I'm sure they'd love to hear from you. Um, and they developed this presentation as part of some ongoing work here at the BCCDC to look at issues of health equity in environmental health practice, which uh, one aspect of which is food security and food safety. So with that, I will pass it over to, I think Wilson's going to start. Yes. Okay, hello everybody and thank you for tuning into our presentation. Our project is on EHO involvement with food security and promoting safe food donations. My name is Wilson. I'm Winifred. I'm Kathy. And I'm Kim. And we are a group of BCIT environmental health graduates with expertise in protecting public health. We have previously collaborated with BCCDC for our health promotion project related to food donations and food insecurity. This has led us to be contracted by Karen Rideau from BCCDC. So this presentation will have an interactive component where we will have some questions directed to you during the course of the presentation. Um, online participants can submit their answers electronically and for those who are listening here in person, you can record your answers on the paper questionnaires. Real-time questions will be provided at relevant slides. So before we begin our presentation, we would like to know how you would rate your current level of knowledge about food security. Please take a moment to answer the question. All right, so based on the answers provided, it seems most of you are quite knowledgeable on uh, food insecurity issues. So hopefully you can learn something today from our presentation. So we'll begin with our topics of discussion we'll be having today. So this would include what is food security? Why should environmental health officers be involved? What are food distribution organizations such as food banks and soup kitchens? What forthcoming BCCDC guidelines are available? How do FDOs address food safety and what are their issues? What are industry issues with food donation? And finally, how can EHOs help promote industry food donations? So we'll begin with our introduction. So what is food, in, uh, food security? So according to the World Health Organization, this is the common definition used by many. Uh, therefore, food insecurity is when people do not have access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to maintain a healthy and active life. And community food security, on the other hand, is a broader concept that is used by many organizations to deal with food insecurity. So according to the 2012 National Canadian Community Health Survey, 1.7 million households experience food insecurity. That means that for every eight houses on average, one household is food insecure. So for this chart on the right, you'll notice that there is marginal food insecurity. That means people who worry about running out of food, either due to a lack of money or a lack of food. And also for severe food in this insecurity, it represents people who might miss meals or go days without food. So as we can see from the chart from 2012 to 2007, there has been an increase in the amount of people who have stated that they are food insecure. So note that even in a rich country like Canada, food insecurity is a problem. So the problem is that the cost of living is continually rising. So many individuals are unable to afford a healthy standard of living, such as access to sufficient and safe, nutritious food. 
In fact, British Columbia's Lower Mainland is ranked second for the highest poverty rate in Canada. For these reasons, food distribution organizations such as food banks and soup kitchens are trying to fill the gap by providing nutritious food to those in need. So you may wonder which groups are uh, food insecure and need uh, services from these food banks. So this includes single parents and also the elderly, those who lack income or have no money, uh, those with a recent illness or are recently disabled, those who have recently lost their jobs or recent immigrants and aboriginals as well. So why is food insecurity a public health issue? Well, food insecurity is a public health issue because an individual's health and well-being are linked to, those, to their household food security. For example, food insecurity is associated with many chronic diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. And obesity is commonly seen among those who are food insecure as cheaper and easily accessible food tends to be lower in nutritional value but higher in um, calories, salt, and saturated fat. So people with limited income sometimes choose energy dense foods to help prevent feelings of hunger and also may purchase uh, packaged foods to avoid loss due to spoilage. Food insecurity also makes it more difficult to meet specific dietary needs associated with chronic health conditions such as uh, diabetes because nutritious food are much more expensive. In addition, inadequate nutrition can have effect on children's health such as their learning ability, physical development, mental health, reduced cognitive development, and also decreased learning ability and academic performance. So this creates a cycle of health-related problems later in life because children who underperform in school may not reach higher levels of education. This in turn can connect back to the issue of low paying jobs or underemployment due to being less educated. So this leads to an inevitable cycle for the inability to have access to food security and result in poor physical and mental health. Also, people living with food security may take more food safety risk in food safety is limited, such as consuming expired foods. Finally, um, food insecurity is associated with social and mental health issues, such as poor functional health, which is conducting uh, normal daily activities, restricted activity, depression, and distress. So an example of distress would be um, distress from a mother deciding whether to spend money on food or whether on housing or transit or other needs. So because of all these factors, um, food inse insecurity is associated with poor health incomes. Okay, so why should EHOs be involved? EHO's traditional role is to conduct inspections to ensure legislative compliance and to protect public health. However, the role of an EHO has been shifting to include health promotion and chronic disease prevention activities. Two examples in BC include EHO's promotion of healthy eating and involvement in healthy built environment. For example, EHO's promote healthy living by, sorry, healthy eating by regulating trans fat in foods at food service establishment because trans fat are associated with heart disease. They are, all, they are also involved in promoting the informed dining program as a part of their food premises regulation or inspection. This program helps uh, consumers eat healthier by making informed choices based on the nutritional content of their foods. The Healthy Built Environment Linkage Toolkit is a provincial resource that links community planning principles to health outcomes. It was developed by the Healthy Built Environment Alliance and um, the Provincial Health Services Authority last April. And this toolkit is used by EHOs to help promote healthier built environment. For example, EHOs were involved in developing a community garden and kitchen to help increase the availability of healthy food sources. So these are examples of EHOs addressing food security issues and they can expand their roles in these areas. So now let's take a look at their legislative background. EHOs are mandated by the Public Health Act to mitigate and prevent public health hazards. Now, a public health hazard is defined as a condition, thing, or activity that presents a risk to public health or is associated with an injury or illness. According to this act, sections 23 to 20 a facility to assess whether a health hazard is present. They also outline EHOs inspection power and when they can conduct an inspection. 
Since the process of donating food from a donor to a food distribution organization, such as a food bank or soup kitchen, may present food safety issues that can lead to a health hazard, BHOs have the potential to become involved. So whether or not food at a food premise is served to a consumer or donated to a food distribution organization, they must be handled safely, and EHOs verify this by conducting regular inspections of these facilities. On the receiver's end, EHOs inspect food distribution organizations such as meal programs that are involved with um, serving or processing food on site to clients. Um, Kim will talk more about um, food distribution organization, which we will refer to FDOs for short, in the later part of the presentation. Similar to a food service establishment, a FDO such as meal program must comply with the food premises regulation, as well as the trans fat limit outlined in the public health impediment regulation. EHO's involvement in food bank is different. A food bank is defined as a nonprofit organization that operates with the exclusive intent of feeding the hungry and handles food to be consumed off the premise, but does not process food. This means that food banks are exempt from the food premises regulation and EHOs do not have the authority to inspect them. Um, the possible reason for exemption may be because food banks do not process food and historically they primarily accept non-potentially hazardous food. So this include dried, canned, or packaged goods that present minimum risk. Also, food banks are a nonprofit, which means that they are operating on the goodwill to feed those in need. So by exempting them, this will allow food banks to operate easier. The main idea is to not um, deter their goodwill to feed those in need by overregulation. But this presents a new issue as food banks are moving towards accepting healthier yet potentially hazardous food, including produce, milk and or dairy and meat products, as these food increases the risk of a health hazard occurrence such as foodborne illnesses. Without EHOs in prevention with food banks, especially those that are currently handling with um, potentially hazardous food, this makes um, public think that the health officials perceive the health and safety of the food insecure as less important. So this brings about the question of whether or not the food premises regulation should be revised to include food banks. Um, especially because the show's role is involved with protecting public health and preventing health hazards. So to summarize what I have been talking about so far, EHOs are already involved in health promotion and healthy built environment initiatives to help address food security issues and reduce chronic health issues. They also have the legislative authority to protect public health. However, their current involvement in food donation and food security issues are limited to their inspection mandate. For example, they mainly inspect uh, FDOs such as meal programs and provide food safe training to handlers, uh, food handlers. Um, since food security is a public health issue and EHOs have much uh, expertise in this area and their main role is to protect public health, they can expand their involvement in this area without a great increase in their workload, time or resources. For example, currently there are many healthy community initiatives that are funded by the Ministry of Health to help improve community health such as by increasing um, food security. And many health authority, healthy built environment teams are already working in these initiatives. So the link between EHOs and health promotion work have already been established. So to expand EHOs role in this area, EHOs can work with healthy community specialists to participate in these initiatives and potentially receive funding to improve food security. So some future potential roles include inviting food banks to agree to receive um, services such as education or inspection to help ensure food safety. There's also a BC Food Donor Encouragement Act that helps protect donors from liability issues as long as they do not donate food that have been contaminated or unfit for consumption. However, as donors are progress, uh, starting to donate perishable foods that require refrigeration, the risk of food being unfit for consumption or um, increases as well as their potential for liability. So this means that there is a real need for EHOs to become involved to educate both donors and FDOs on food, safe food donations. Also, many donors are unaware of this act, so EHOs can leverage the relationship with food industry operators to promote this act to educate them about liability issues and help reduce the potential for liability. EHOs can also promote the forthcoming BCCDC guidelines to donors to help them with the donation process. Now, Kathy will go into more details about these types of guidelines. And lastly, EHOs can promote the food industry to donate healthy foods during routine inspection. 
actually quick testing. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. So if you didn't hear that last part, just if you haven't answered um, the question, uh, if you could take a moment now. And the question is, as an EHO, have you engaged with an FDO regarding food donations? So currently it looks like over 50% of you have, so that's interesting. Thank you for answering. So we'll move on. As Kim mentioned, the guidelines for FDOs with grocery meal program is currently being developed to assess FDOs with donated foods. This guideline has been reviewed by BCCDC, Greater Food Bank of Vancouver, Food Banks BC, Interior Health Authority, Vancouver Coastal Health Authority, Ministry of Health, Dietitians from HealthLink BC, and the Provincial Health Services Authority, Food Security. This guideline will be made available within the next month. So the purpose of this guideline is for FDOs with grocery or meal programs to adjust the need to redistribute high quality and nutritional foods rather than shelf stable food products. In addition to food safety, the new guideline will address food security and nutritional aspects, discuss its relationship with FDOs, food industry, and their volunteers, and uses flowcharts or updated graphics as a resourceful tools for staffs and volunteers to assess food safety. EHO can reference this guideline during the inspections to provide advice about the FDO's facility, equipment, as well as safe food handling. Some of the main points to point out from this guideline is that healthy eating is important to everyone to optimize health, support growth in children, prevent diseases, and manage chronic conditions. Healthy food and beverages are minimally processed and consist of little or no sugar added, little sodium, little saturated fats, and little or no trans fat. Hence, to meet these needs for the clients, FDOs need healthy foods and beverage donations such as fresh fruits and vegetables, dairy products, healthy protein sources, and whole grains, rather than the he less healthy foods, as shown in this slide. The guideline also provides some tips for establishing relationship with food donors, volunteers, and other FDOs when donating food. Food donors and FDOs need to ha have a sound business relationship to clarify agreements or expectations of both parties. Some approaches listed in this guideline that have been helpful for food donors and FDOs in developing and maintaining a positive relationship include making presentations on topics about why food donations are necessary, how the FDOs plan to use the donated foods, and how it will benefit the community. Another would be to clarify the BC Food Donor Encouragement Act with written agreement to secure businesses and any ambiguity. Another would have for the food donors fill a registration form which details the types of food that the food donor will have available for donations, their contact information, and general issues such as cancellation of the agreement. Another was have the food donor fill a memorandum of understanding form to clarify mutual expectations that fits the donor's needs. This allows the, agree this allows the food donors have a say on how their food products will be utilized, such as if their donated foods can be used for cooking class or low-cost meals. And lastly, setting schedules for pickup or delivery between the food donors and FDOs to prevent any conflicts. Donating healthy and nutritional foods can be challenging, especially when FDO's goal is to offer safe foods. The guideline is intended to help FDOs optimize food access through food recovery and reduce the risk of distributing unsafe foods. The guideline covers several food categories to help FDOs determine the relative risk associated with the various food categories. This will ensure that safe food handling and distribution precautions are taken, are taken into consideration when accepting these foods. EHOs can help elaborate and educate FDOs on safe food handling on the following food categories listed in the slides from the lowest risk to the highest risk. One thing that FDOs need to assure foods are safe to be donated is assessing the packaging of the food products to make sure that it's not compromised and is safe for consumption. Foods unacceptable for packaging includes damaging to the packaging, dates, packaging dates have been exceeded, it's a food recall product or has been mishandled. Some packaging damage can be managed, however, if the inner contents have not been compromised, such as being damaged or exposed. For example, only the box of the package could have been split open, but the inner contents or the baggie is still intact. Then the food must be properly labeled with the name of the food and its best before date for it to be considered acceptable for donation. 
This guideline details some of the standards that are considered acceptable and unacceptable. For example, this diagram shows what the guideline will show about the, how to assess the packaging of the food product. When FDOs are accepting donated foods, they need to ensure that the food products are properly labeled so the food product, if it's ever under recall, can be traced back to the supplier, <coughs> donor, and the person who has received them. Any food that has been broken down for repackaging must also be properly labeled. Properly labeled assures that specific foods are not distributed to individuals who have food sensitivities, food allergies, and for tracking or recall purposes. The food label information requires product name, ingredients with allergen declared, best before date, expired date, or use by date, as well as the source of the food. If a food that has an improper labeling, during pickup, a driver or a food rescue label should be affixed onto the product to ensure that these food products will be distributed appropriately. For example, here a food rescue label, a driver would fill out and affix to the products when delivering it back to the FDOs to make sure that the foods will be distributed appropriately. And finally, generating waste in is inevitable. Reducing food waste to landfills and donating high quality and nutritional foods to FDOs for redistributing can prevent unnecessary food waste and provide surplus foods to those who need some. However, foods that do not get distributed at FDOs comes at a cost but it can be managed to prevent them from entering straight into the landfills. This guideline provides some, several businesses that can recycle the food scraps to other beneficial products such as animal feed or energy. All right. It's still working? Yep. Okay. <laughs> So in order to learn more about how the food donation process works, we spoke with the food distribution organization, specifically a food bank. We talked about the flow of food in their food distribution process, as well as what they currently do to address food safety concerns. According to this food bank, the most commonly donated food items are prepackaged foods such as chips and candy. Uh, baked food, um, such as bread, muffins, are also commonly donated items. But unfortunately, these types of items are not high nutritional value. On the other hand, the most needed items consist of canned fruit and vegetables, pasta sauce, whole wheat pasta and rice, canned meat and fish, peanut butter, and baby food and formula are also high in demand. And in general, uh, food distribution organizations have stated that they need more fresh fruits and vegetables, juice, milk, yogurt, and meat, and meat alternative products. So here is a quick summary of their food donation process. So the general uh -huh. process goes, uh, food is transported from the food donor to the food bank warehouse and then out to the recipient whether that be an individual in need or another FDO, such as a meal program, who will further prepare and process the food. So donated food usually comes from personal donations, so that could be a donation bin at a grocery store or from a food drive. Another common source are reclaimed foods. Now, these are foods that have been damaged or are unpresentable in some way, so they're not sold via retail and are instead donated. After the food's received, the food is checked and culled, and any damaged food is discarded. After the culling, food is then sorted and it's stored until needed. And also any financial donations that the food bank received go towards purchasing food items that they still need. This food bank also participates in a food premises pickup program uh, in which food is picked up and then taken to meal programs. Examples of types of foods that are picked up include leftover entrees. So this could be from a food premises that does a buffet and they've prepared extra trays of food for the buffet that have not um, made it out to the buffet. So instead, they get donated to the food bank. Um, other typically donated foods include meat and dairy products, produce, bread and baked goods and sandwiches, um, are also another common item from food premises. So in general, how this program works is when a donor has an item for pickup, they'll call the food bank, will then organize a pickup, and they'll send their driver in a refrigerated vehicle. 
who will pick up the food and then deliver it on the same day out to the meal program who has requested the food items. Um, and then the meal program will prepare and serve the food immediately. Although this industry pickup program is a great way for FDOs to receive and distribute more healthy and nutritional food items, uh, one problem many FDOs encounter is that because they are operated on a limited, operating on a limited budget, they have access to limited resources. So this, this food bank we spoke to was able to purchase a refrigerated vehicle. However, many smaller food distributing organizations are not financially able to purchase refrigerated vehicles and instead rely on volunteers who will transport food in their personal vehicles. So a possible solution to this is that these smaller FDOs could contact their local health authority with food safety questions and help um, get an idea if, they're, if what they're planning on doing could be safe. So an example of this um, that the food bank manager told us was uh, there was a case where an EHO worked with a local FDO um, to determine whether they could safely transport food in a portable cooler. So the EHO tested this cooler and they found it was able to maintain temperatures below 4 degrees for 4 hours. So it was all right for transporting food as long as they didn't exceed 4 hours. So even though FDOs operate on limited resources, food safety concerns with donated food still need to be taken very seriously. So we asked the food bank about what measures they do to ensure their food is handled safely. To assess the safety of their donated foods, the food bank manager said they conduct visual inspections and they also verify, verify that the cold chain is maintained for potentially hazardous foods. During their visual inspections, they look for signs of pest contamination. They also look to see if there's been any damaged goods, such as broken packaging. They look for dented or bulging cans. And they also ensure that the best before dates meet their standards. In regards to the refrigerated food items, they ensure that the temperatures are maintained um, throughout food transportation and storage. For example, um, well, for this food bank, all the food truck drivers are food safe certified. And when they go to pick up the food items, they ensure that they are still at refrigerated temperatures. They also maintain temperature logs. And um, of course, all potentially hazardous foods that require refrigeration are transported in refrigerated vehicles. So FDOs do their due diligence to ensure that foods are safe from the point of pickup to consumption. However, they're not able to tell if or how food has been handled prior to pickup. So prior to pickup, the onus for food safety falls on the donor. Because food premises are inspected and food handlers are food safe certified, FDOs do trust that food premises will handle food safely. However, in order to strengthen this trust, there is an option for FDOs to sign a written agreement with donors confirming that they will handle the food safely prior to their pickup. But trusting food donors to do their dil diligence does not always mean that they will. Um, the food bank manager did mention that they had encountered some issues with donated food items. For example, food industry donors might not be able to determine what food items are safe for donation. They might not be able to differentiate between foods that are still safe and edible and those that should be discarded. And they might not have the knowledge about what foods are needed by food banks. In addition, the food bank manager had mentioned that on several occasions, they had observed food items that were not properly protected from contamination. So when the driver went to go pick up the food, he noticed meat that was being stored on top of produce items. And finally, donors may not know that processed foods, such as cut fruits and vegetables, present higher food safety risks than those that are unprocessed, such as whole fruits and vegetables. So these issues do raise food safety concerns and could potentially lead to foodborne illness. So they require an EHO's attention and involvement. 
Oh, yes. Sorry, before we move on, um, if we could now take a minute just to answer our third interactive question. So based on what you've heard some up until now and your previous knowledge, if you could please select all issues of concern that you have that relate to food donations and food distribution organizations. So it's the third question there. Just to let the room know, it looks like, what's the highest one? It looks like, Yeah, so time and temperature of youth of potentially hazardous foods during transportation is the most concerning issue. Okay, so we've been talking about the food distribution organization, but what is the role for the food industry when donating high quality and nutritional food? The BCCDC is currently in the progress of developing the industry food donation guideline to help assist food donors. This guideline will be made available within the next two months. This guideline was developed to help food industry donate safe, healthy, and fresh foods to FDOs. It also outlines what retailers, farmers, food manufacturers, and other businesses need to know about donating safe and quality foods. Users can reference this, food, reference this to food industry to this guideline when they have any inquiries on the process of donating food. This guideline outlines the benefits of donating foods to FDOs, and users can inform the food industry on the following benefits. So the first one is to increase community level engagement by donating safe and healthy foods to reduce food insecurity, to reduce environmental impact by reducing food and packaging waste such as recycling and composting that would otherwise go to landfills, increase corporate social responsibility, attract social conscious consumers, increase financial benefits such as tax deduction benefits and reduce cost for waste management such as recycling and composting. Food industry may request charitable tax receipts, but only FDOs that are registered as charities can issue them. Each can tell the food industry to consult with their accountants and the Canadian Revenue Agency for further advice. And lastly, address liability concerns to reduce donors' potential for liability. There are many reasons why food is deemed unsellable. Some, on, some of the reasons include overstocking of an item near its best before date, underweight of packaging, and food contamination during food processing. EHS can use this guideline to provide information to the food industry to assess if their unsellable food is appropriate for donations. So for a flow diagram, uh, the food industry would first have to determine if their food is unsellable and if it's appropriate for donation. Once that is decided, the food industry can determine which FDOs to donate their foods to. And once that is decided, both the FDOs and the food industry needs to record and track their food donations for recall and tracking purposes. Okay, so why should uh, the food industry donate? So according to Food Banks BC, food banks help out around 97,000 individuals in BC each month. And in addition, many other programs uh, help out other individuals as well, such as soup kitchens. And in fact, food banks use in BC has increased by 24.7% since 2008. Um, People who use food banks include children and families, um, single people, workers who are underpaid or underemployed, and those who are unemployed as well. So in addition, donating food can also help uh, reduce waste to the landfills. So it's important for food service establishments to understand the significance of donating to FDOs because $27 billion worth of food uh, entered a landfill each year. A survey conducted by Metro Vancouver last year has actually shown that 35% of waste going to the landfill were compostable organics. So food waste also generates packaging waste and wastes resources to produce the food as well. So in addition, Metro Vancouver also estimated that 13,000 tons of food that was thrown away by food, business, food businesses last year was suitable, suitable for consumption at the point of disposal and could have been donated instead. So since landfills are limited in space and creating more landfills is undesirable, it's important that safe and edible food is donated rather than discarded. So 
recently Metro Vancouver has banned food scraps from um, disposal as garbage. This includes foods such as raw foods or cooked foods, um, leftovers and even expired foods. So many um, food service establishments such as restaurants and grocery stores that are affected by this new policy will need to find alternative options to deal with their leftover food. However, donating food is not an alternative for discarding foods such as unsafe food, uh, contaminated food or expired foods. So this is actually a great opportunity for the food industry to be educated and encouraged on the benefits of donating food. Oh yes, sorry about that. And yeah, we also have an interactive component for this part. So as an EHO, have you ever engaged with a food industry regarding food donations? Please take a moment to answer this question. Wow, so based on the results, um, most of you have been engaged with the food industry regarding food donations. That's a very surprising <laughs> value. Okay, next part. As you have heard throughout our presentation, we have discussed some possible avenues for EHOs to become involved with food donations. As an example, we'll run you through a real life case, case study of EHO involvement with the Kitimat Food Share, and then we'll conclude with the summary of our presentation. So the Kitimat Food Share program is a food recovery program administered by the Kitimat Community Services Society this program collects perishable food item, items that would otherwise be disposed of and distributes them to those in need. The food share is classified as a food bank, so it's therefore exempt under the BC Food Premises Regulation. Because the Kitimat Food Share incorporated EHO input from its, in, from its creation, the EHO was successfully able to provide food, food safety advice and guidance they were able to teach food safe to the food bank staff and volunteers with emphasis on relevant food safety practices such as the safe transportation and storage of potentially hazardous foods. They were also able to provide linkages to other health services such as mental health and nutritionists. And they were also able to advocate the BC Food Donor Encouragement Act to food premises in the community. And because of this collaboration, the Kitimat Food Chair was able to see the following successes. They saw an increase in safe food handling practices at the food share. They saw an increase in healthy food distrib distributed to the food insecure population. And they, they saw a reduction in disposal costs for the food industry. And good food was diverted from the local landfill. Okay, so as demonstrated in this presentation, food insecurity is a public health issue that is associated with uh, chronic illnesses, mental and social health issues, and may affect children's learning um, ability as well as physical development. Although accessing food from a FDO is not the ultimate solution to address food insecurity, it does help improve the quality of food available to people who are food insecure. FDOs provide um, very important assistance to address food insecurity. However, many of them operate on limited resources, making it difficult for them to accept healthy foods. FDOs also receive very small amount of these healthy foods, whereas yet those who go to a FDO for foods are usually the ones most in need of these healthy and nutritious food. And they may be in poor health, which makes them vulnerable to foodborne illnesses. So all of these factors really call for EHO's intervention. Um, with EHO's mandate in protecting public health, um, they can help address food insecurity issues as promoters and educators. For example, they can promote the food industry to donate healthy foods during routine inspection. They can promote the BC Food Donor Encouragement Act and the forthcoming BC CDC guidelines to donors to help address liability concerns as well as assisting them with the process of donation. 
Initials can also inspect food banks as per the request to help um, maintain food safety and reduce the potential for liability. And they can also educate donors and FDOs on safe food donations. Lastly, EHOs can educate donors um, about providing relevant food information to FDOs. These may include ingredient lists, best before dates, and product codes to address allergy or food quality and even uh, recall issues. So based on the kid and Matt case study that Kim has just described, we can see that each role can go beyond their inspection mandate. And in some areas of BC, EHOs are already actively involved with the donation process, and they were a great success. Since food donation and security issues exist in many communities, um, EHOs in other parts of BC should follow these footsteps and expand their involvement in these areas. With EHOs intervention, less edible and safe food would um, be donated rather than discarded. Sorry, more food, safe and healthy food will be donated rather than discarded, which helps move our community towards a more sustainable place to live in. Most importantly, um, those who are in need of food can have access to safe and healthy food um, that would otherwise be discarded. So this concludes our presentation. Thank you so much for tuning in to listen. Before we move on to answering your questions, um, we would like to ask you one last question to assess how much you have learned about food security. So please take a moment to rate your current level of knowledge about food security after listening to this presentation.